chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Give yourself the gift of insane savings this holiday season with Mint Mobile's best wireless deal of the year. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. That's six months of premium wireless service for the price of three. Mint Mobile lets you order and activate from home while saving tons on phone plans, starting at just $15 a month. Seriously, I can't think of a better gift than turning an overpriced wireless bill into just 15 bucks a month with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 6. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing five tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Johnny Nava, Ron Reiki, Micah Edwards, and Kyle Harrison. Tonight, we'll hear stories of wretched rescues Angelic antics, anticipated arrivals, spine-jingling survivals, and alien automatons. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first three spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> the poles. The areas above and below those imaginary circles... We call the Arctic and the Antarctic. We would like to think we've conquered the land masses of this planet, 
but we still don't know as much as we'd like to. Tonight we'll be encountering things that live in these colder reaches of the Earth, whether we go looking for them or they come looking for us. Tonight we begin with the tale of a remote research station that suddenly isn't talking to anyone. Never a good sign, that. But as Johnny Neva will be showing us, sometimes even bad omens can turn out to be much, much worse than originally thought. Without further ado, I present to you Shiver. When you can hear your heartbeat, you know it's quiet. Antarctica is referred to as the land of pure silence because sound is measured in single-digit decibels. During the winter, the sun sets below the summit and stays there for months. Darkness swallows the continent, and the icy plateau becomes the coldest place on Earth. Winds howl through the landscape. Occasionally, the creaking of ice echoes through the sound waves. Most of the time, it's a world enveloped in stillness. In a world of sensory deprivation, you become the sound. The gentle exhale of a breath becomes as thunderous as a bolt of lightning. Winter descended upon the bottom of the world, and the summer crew had long departed. What was left was a skeleton crew of about 40 people in total. Their numbers were made up of research scientists, maintenance engineers, kitchen staff, and a single doctor. Most of them were stationed at Antarctica's main base, McMurdo Station, while a detachment of five ventured to the South Pole Station, where they were to study weather patterns until they could make their safe return in the spring. All of this was standard practice for research in the Seventh Continent. However, about three weeks ago, transmissions flatlined. Since explorers first made their way to the frozen island, there have only been three rescue attempts made for the crew. They were reserved for only the most urgent of cases and only occurred in the summer. The radio silence of every station on the continent made an exception that would be made for a winter operation. For this mission, Taylor, Reed, Sam, and Stella had been selected to board a small twin otter aircraft, the Penguin, and venture into the long night in search of survivors. Taylor zipped her jacket up to her nose and gazed out of the window of the Penguin. A vast landscape of ice and sea extended into the darkness before but her eyes were directed upwards. Here, in a sky absent of any pollution, the southern lights danced in an array of green and purple brilliance that seemed to trail infinitely in every direction. Taylor stared at the lights in a trance. The phenomenon was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. Solar wind. Whispered a voice from behind her. Huh? Taylor snapped from her daze. She turned to see Stella leaning over her lap to catch a glimpse from the same window. Solar wind, she reiterated. Basically, the heat escaping the sun forms charged particles that travel all the way to Earth. When they get here, they crash into the Earth's magnetic field, and we get that, Stella said, pointing to the light display. You must be the scientist, Taylor replied. Everything happened so fast I didn't have a time to look through everyone's files. I barely had time to pack a bag, Taylor extended her hand. I'm Taylor, engineer. Stella nodded and she shook her hand. Stella. Actually, Sam and I are both scientists. Stella pointed to Sam, who cocooned himself in blankets. We've done seven stints together during the summer here. It's much warmer that time of year, if you could use warm to describe it. Eight stints, the cocoon chimed in. And there's free pizza all the time. Very true. Do we need to do this right now, Sam mumbled. I'm trying to sleep. Stella repositioned herself back in her seat and flicked her head towards Sam. He's always like that. Just get used to it now, she said. Stella turned her attention to the fourth passenger. And you must be the ranger, she teased. I heard you were sent to train soldiers in Ukraine. Are you going to teach us how to shoot a gun or what? Reed glanced at Stella. He studied her with his eyes until he seemed to form a judgment. 
Then he pulled a hood over his head and pretended to rest. Good talk, she said. Stella took a seat beside Taylor, and the pair stared up at dancing lights. The planned simplicity was the only reason most of the crew signed up for it. It was a year's worth of pay to make the trek to the station, repair the communication lines, and then radio in the same crew that dropped them off for extraction. Stella and Sam were the guides, and Taylor was to perform the repairs. Ridgeroll was to pilot the helicopter and to act as insurance. He'd survived in less forgiving conditions and was there to make sure the crew arrived at McMurdo without a hitch. The Penguin touched down on the small island of Williams Field at 0800. The plan was to stay the night and then make the short flight to McMurdo via helicopter the following morning. The passengers worked together to unload the cargo and then set up a camp inside one of the orange and white buildings that made up the only structures on the island. The rooms were cold and metallic and boasted none of the sci-fi chic charm of McMurdo Station. Inside were a couple of bunk beds, a radio station, a first aid kit stuck to the wall, and a few non-perishable food kits. The four entered the unit and began unpacking the equipment they'd brought onto steel tables that jutted out from the wall. Taylor lifted her pack onto a surface. She unpacked and tested her communication devices, then made her way to the radio unit and toyed with the controls. Sam slung his bags onto a top bunk and planted himself onto the floor, where he seemed to contemplate his existence for several minutes. Reed set his things down, announced to the crew he was stepping out to check on the chopper, and then dismissed himself. Stella ruffled through the cabinets and located some crackers and canned fish. Sam, look, she exclaimed. They have your favorite. She turned to him and posed with a can of mackerel as if she were auditioning for a commercial. Sam cracked a smile at the sight. If I wasn't already married, I'd marry you right now, he said. Sam, behave, we have company, Stella flirted. She approached Taylor and placed a hand on her shoulder. Do you want me to make you dinner, hon? It's not much, I admit, but as you can see, there aren't a whole lot of options for takeout here. Taylor removed a set of headphones from her ears and turned around. No worries, I'm not too picky, as long as it's not dolphin or something. Eh, no promises. Stella prepared the meals on paper plates and distributed them to the crew. Taylor configured with the comms, but her efforts turned up nothing but dead air. As the crew finished up with their snack, Reed entered the door. We're solid, Reed said more to himself than any of them. He pulled a chair from beside Taylor, raised his pack onto his lap, and reached inside. From somewhere, buried deep within, Reed produced a 9 millimeter handgun. Stella approached Reed with hesitation in a plate of food. She paused upon seeing the pistol. Is that really necessary? she asked, concerned. Reed removed the magazine, counted the bullets, and pushed the mag back inside with a click. I guess we'll find out, he replied. The next morning, the crew loaded into a helicopter and set off toward McMurdo Station. The rhythmic flutter of the helicopter blades echoed against the ice and drowned out all attempts at conversation. The team traveled in silence for the short trip to the base. Ever since she was a girl, Taylor had loved being in the sky. Being above the clouds made her feel alive. Although the helicopter couldn't take her to the same heights as a plane, she relished in the sight despite the frigid air. From their elevated position, her eyes fixated on the views offered by the window. Icebergs bobbed in the water like pieces of a frozen jigsaw puzzle. Above them, the stars shone in a cosmic glory reserved for the world's most desolate places. She was aware that most of the animals who occupied the frozen land only did so in the summer. However, she secretly hoped to catch an emperor penguin. Birdwatching was a secret interest she had a difficult time conceding even to herself. Taylor would have been embarrassed to admit she had prayed for an encounter with the bird as recently as the night before. Although, if she were honest, any form of arctic life would have satisfied her. As the chopper hovered toward McMurdo, the outline of its buildings began to form shapes in the darkness. 
The sight of them was a shot of espresso for Stella. She began pointing them out to Taylor and explaining their purposes. The four white domes of the James Way huts were relics of the station and functioned as housing and storage. Big Blue was the iconic rec center where the summer crew gathered for meals, accessed computers, and played board games until they got bored. There was the water desalination plant, there was the Crary Lab, which was shaped like a giant white H, and there was even a church called the Chapel of Snows, where folks gathered on Sunday for worship or other communal activities. Stella spoke in one long sentence describing all the sites and the sense of community the station fostered. For all her talk about the people who made up the frozen town, there didn't seem to be anyone there now. The absence of people spooked Taylor. She tried to ward off her nerves by interrupting. Are those the communication towers, she asked, pointing to a pair of vertical spikes in the distance. Yes, Stella replied. I don't see anybody there now, but it's like 70 below right now. I'm sure they're all inside. Once we touch down and unload our stuff, I'll take you to wherever you need. Stella took a deep breath and primed herself to continue her speech. Reed, who seemed to be hating everything about this conversation, surged forward in his seat and punched Sam awake. You got eyes on what I'm seeing down there? Reed asked the crew. They did. The corpse lay half-exposed in ice between the station and the shoreline. Blood seeped into the snow around it, highlighting the body's shape on the horizon. The mass was too big to be human, but too mutilated to identify from their height. There was an unspoken agreement that this would be the first thing to investigate upon touching the ground, and none of them were thrilled. Stella was at a loss for words for maybe the first time in her life. Sam maneuvered to the seat next to Stella and pulled his body to his. Taylor shoved her hands in her pockets and began picking at her thumbs with her pointed fingers. Reed lowered the aircraft toward the earth and asked Taylor to hand him his bag. The team touched ground and made their way to the carcass. The world around them was black, so they looped their fingers around each other's belt loops and walked in a straight line. The only sounds were the crunch of the ice compressing beneath their boots and the howl of the wind that chilled them to their bones. Even Reed, the stoic soldier, seemed to be affected by the cold. The uneven skyline and lack of light meant they were stuck following Reed, but the ranger led them with confidence until they arrived at the monstrosity. Even up close, it was difficult to tell what had been killed. In temperatures this cold, bodies don't decompose, they freeze. Before them was a frozen mangle of tissue, organs, and bones scattered in every direction. Reed approached the remains and knelt beside them. He clicked on a flashlight and held it in his mouth as he picked up pieces of bone to inspect in the light. Reed spat out the light into a gloved hand and turned toward the scientists. It's an orca, he said. Something killed it, then ate it. An orca? You mean like a killer whale? Sam stammered. You're the scientist, said Reed. An orca, Sam repeated. Okay, well, let's not freak out. Taylor began whilst bearing the urge to freak out. There has to be some kind of explanation that makes sense. It could have been another whale or a leopard seal or something, all right? Stella shook her head. No way. Orcas are the apex predator out here. Leopard seal taking down an orca? Not happening. Reed marched south. His light lingered on the trail of blood as he followed it south toward the water. Looks like whatever killed this thing dragged it over here before digging in. He clicked his teeth. Not good. Maybe whoever was here ran out of food and they hunted this thing so they didn't starve? Taylor reasoned. I mean, we didn't even check the station. There could be a party going on inside for all we know. Yeah, Sam said. And maybe Santa Claus came down here on his sleigh with presents for us. And maybe he'll even give us a ride home if we ask. It's an orca, Taylor. You think a group of nerds is capable of killing a killer whale and dragging it all the way here? He screamed. Shh. Reed put a finger to his lips and surveyed his surroundings. No one spoke. 
The gentle whirl of the wind over the land was the only sound in existence. Waves of light shimmered above them over a blanket of stars that shined like glitter against the sky in the night. A haunting screech pierced the stillness. The wail was a guttural howl that cut through the darkness like a sonic boom from the direction they came from. The group turned toward the source of the sound, desperate for their collective intuition to be proven wrong, but they were disappointed. The cry stemmed from McMurdo Station. Nuh-uh. Nope. No. I mean, hell no. Stella began. Reed, Sam pleaded, you have to take us back. And I mean fly us back. I mean, we're way in over our heads, and aren't being paid nearly enough for this. I don't care if we have to sleep outside. I am not. Reed went down to a knee and brought the handgun out of his pack. We're not prepared to sleep outside. We do that, we freeze. Sam threw his hands up and stomped away from Reed. Taylor approached Reed and lowered herself down to his level. Have you seen anything like this before? she asked. His eyes darted towards Taylor and shook his head. Never, he replied, rising to his feet. Unfortunately, the only way back is the way we came. If we... The howl came again. A hideous roar traveling on serrated winds. This time, its origin seemed to come from the ocean. Flesh gripped Taylor by the arm and pulled her body with such force she almost lost her balance. Taylor twisted round to see Stella, white-knuckling her bicep to her own body. She removed one glove and ran it gently through Stella's hair in an attempt to calm her. She squinted at the sea and caught a flicker of motion beneath the tides. Reed! she screamed. Lightning struck without a flash. The sound of a thousand fissures trailing through the expanse creaked like gunshots. Ice fractured around them. Water rippled out to the surface and began sucking down small islands of ice toward the coast. One colossal fracture moved in the direction of the party. Taylor yanked Stella toward the station and took off in a sprint toward whatever shapes were visible to her in the distance. Stella stumbled to the ground, recovered her balance, and began chasing after Taylor. Reed hesitated but soon strode toward the buildings. His line of sight never strayed from the chaos unfolding beneath the surface before him. Sam was the last to move. His body seemed to disappear in a flash of a geyser. The moment he made his first step toward the others, the ground seemed to explode beneath him. Water burst toward the heavens and descended with a liquid crunch. Sam, the orca, and everything else around him melted into the ocean. A cobweb of ice bobbed around where Sam once stood. There was no such thing as pain. Adrenaline suppressed it. The survivors gulped in frozen air and the wind whipped at their exposed skin. Their bodies pumped battery acid into their thighs as their bodies carried them across the wasteland. It didn't matter. Their pace remained the same until they reached the gates of the colossal turquoise building. Taylor ripped open the doors. She held one ajar until Reed and Stella barreled through the entrance themselves. She slammed it shut, locked it behind them, and then collapsed to the ground. The laboratories of McMurdo Station were connected by slender hallways that led into cavernous observation rooms, science labs, and other recreational facilities. Judging by the abundance of picnic tables, steel trays, and frozen, half-eaten dishes, Taylor deducted that they had arrived in the mess hall. The exertion of their sprint caught up to her. She unzipped her jacket and spread out across the towel, face down. As her body heaved against the floor, she wondered if she was lucky to have survived, or unlucky to have not shared a demise that was as swift as Sam's. Get up, Reed said, kicking her heel with his boot. We need to keep moving. There was a gentleness in his tone that was unfamiliar but appreciated, given the context. Taylor nodded and picked herself up. She offered a hand to Stella, who accepted it with caution. Change of plans, he began. It looks like the chopper is going to be our only route out of here, but we need to uh, get some more fuel. Taylor, you see, if you can get up the comms and running, uh, I'll look for fuel and see if there are any survivors. Taylor and comms, yes. Stella shook her head and in a whisper, 
Fuel and survivors? Not happening. No way. You have a better plan? asked Reed. No, she replied. But yours is suicide. You may be an army seal or whatever, but I'm a biologist. And that out there is nothing like anything I've ever seen. She peered out the window, paranoid, and then slunk down to sit on the ground. Look at that whale out there. I don't think it was just leftovers. I think whatever that thing is left the Arca there to lure us to it. Like a spider web, Taylor asked. Why would it do that? I don't know. I don't even know if it's a fish, a mammal, or if it's from outer space. But that creature was dragged and left there. For something that size, anything is on the menu. It doesn't need to eat us. Stella, I think Sam might disagree with you on that one. Reed said, Sam got killed, Stella snapped. But it wasn't for food. I think we might have something it wants. <laughs> the whale came again. Its whale bounced off the metal surfaces around them like a haunted pinball. This time it was closer, much closer. From somewhere on the opposite side of the hall came the faint click of metal on metal, moving towards them in an anarchic rhythm. Taylor dove underneath one of the lunch benches and watched in silent horror as her senses directed her attention to the end of the room. Opposite her was a hallway that extended into an abyss to some other part of the building. The southern lights flickered in kaleidoscopic brilliance across the black hole in the wall. For a minute or an hour, there was no sound. Nothing but the sound of their gentle breaths and their own heartbeats. The creature that emerged from the blackness was towering, slender and somehow darker than the blackness it emerged from. The shape of its body was in the embellished shape of a man's. It walked on its hind legs. It had two limbs where arms should have been, but these were superficial traits that were only vaguely humanoid. Its arms stretched down to its ankles and its fingers were blades so long they dragged against the floor as it walked. Its head resembled that of a decaying elk except for its snout, which was pressed to the ground in search of a specific scent as it moved toward the party. It reeked of decomposing flesh. The smell was so foul, Taylor forced a hand to her mouth to prevent herself from hurling. She shut her eyes tight. When she found the courage to open them, she discovered Stella and Reed occupying the same space beneath the table across from her. Reed had one finger to his lips and the other hand pressing the gun to his waist. The creature reached up and wrapped its grip around a handful of pipes in the ceiling. It let out a primordial wail so loud it vibrated the tables they were hiding under. The pipes in the ceiling gave way to the weight of the creature and copper tubes cascaded to the ground and erupted in a symphony of dissonance. This was their chance. Reed sucked in his lips and his eyes bulged out of his head. No words were spoken, but the message was clear. Run. Reed rolled out of his position and bounced to his feet. Bang! 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 Three shots were the only rounds Reed was able to get off. By the second shot, the creature was on him. By the third, his cries of agony were overlaid with the sound of the bullets. By the time Taylor and Stella were rounding the corner out of the mess hall, the creature had split Reed in two and was devouring the part of his torso that carried his heart. Taylor and Stella charged down the hall before them. They attempted to open each door they passed, but each effort they made was met with stiff resistance of a lock. Behind them, they could hear momentum building from the creature who had just severed Reed. Not once did they look over their shoulders, but their desperation for an open door increased with each failure. The screech came again from somewhere close by. A response came from outside the building. Whatever creatures these were, they were closing the distance between them. The pair bolted through the building until they reached an end with two exits. One was back out into the snow, where they could try their luck flying home. The other was to an observation tower located above the blue building. Taylor grabbed the handle of the door and, and said a silent prayer. Go! Stella screeched, forcing Taylor's hand. The hatch spill opened and the girls tumbled through the entryway. 
Stella was on her feet faster than she fell. She slammed the door into the frame and then locked it behind them. The room they found themselves in was the foyer of the observation tower. There was a steel ladder in the center of the room extending up into the tower. Specks of dried blood peppered the floor and some of the ladder's steps. Taylor ran a hand down her face and bit down on one of her nickels. After observing the blood, she decided it was best to ignore it altogether. What now? Taylor asked. Stella shrugged and then made a space for herself beside Taylor. Way I see it, neither of us know how to fly a helicopter. We could take our chances, swim back, or we could try and get the comms up and running, and send the SOS we came here to send, Stella exclaimed. I know what my vote is. Well, then it's unanimous, Taylor said, rising to her feet again. Taylor ascended first. She climbed until she reached the metal hatch at the top. She attempted to push her way through with a single arm, but the door pushed back with great force. Come on, Stella commanded Taylor with her best impersonation of a varsity coach. You got this. Taylor wrestled her gloves off with her mouth, one hand at a time, took a deep breath and then pushed against the door with as much force as she could summon. The weight of the supplies acting as a counterweight came down with the metallic applause of a kitchen accident. The two remained still, waiting for a reaction, then proceeded when the only sound they heard was their breathing. The observatory was a small octagon, made of black steel frame and thick glass. Every cabinet in sight was ajar, their contents spilled carelessly on the floor beneath them. The radio systems looked functional, but as though they had been tampered with. In the corner of the room was a dead man with one arm. He was an older man with thick white hair and black-rimmed glasses. One hand gripped a half-empty bottle of bourbon. The other was a tangle of tendons, muscle, and fat, frozen to a pool of blood gathering beneath his corpse. Stella approached the body and plucked the bottle from the man's cold, dead fingers. "'Leave it to you to go out with a drink in your hand,' she said to the body. Then she knelt, picked a pair of glasses from the floor, and poured the bourbon a bit into each glass. "'Get to work while I pour, Taylor.' Taylor got to work. The radio system was functional, but there was an issue with coax cable. She followed the line to a section of the wall that had been ripped open in an attempt at troubleshooting the issue. To others, the snake pit of cords and cables would have seemed as foreign as lines of code to a caveman. To Taylor, these were puzzles to be solved. You're going to like this, Taylor said. The radio comms isn't connected to the antenna for this station. I think that's what your friend was trying to do before. Right. So what was the issue, Stella replied. Taylor smirked. Not much, outside of a section of the coax cable being damaged from the weather. I reconnected the transmission line to the radio kid. Uh, we should be able to be all set to send a message. Taylor switched on the radio system, and the static feedback they received kindled a spark of hope between them. The two embraced each other, and then Taylor bowed her head toward the mic and pressed record. The hours that passed seemed like decades. The two leaned back in chairs and sipped on whatever was left of the bourbon. Stella sighed, and she reached into her pack and produced a tin of fish, the same brand they'd eaten the night before. I know you're probably not starving right now, but given the situation, you should probably refuel. Stella popped the tin open, plucked out an oily piece of meat, then held the tin up to Taylor. Eat! Taylor nodded again and grabbed a piece. The two ate in silence. Prehistoric roars came in intervals that shook the foundation of the building. The dead one-armed scientist still occupied the same room, and the hope for survival seemed to shrink every time Taylor gave it serious consideration. Hope was in little supply, but it was not impossible to find. As she gazed out the observatory, the universe expanded before her. Infinite timeless, soaked in light from another dimension. The only signs of light were the relics of the people who had lived here before their arrival, against the cosmic canvas offered by the view of the observatory. Taylor felt smaller than she ever had before. 
She leaned back and went limp against the wall, surrendering to the cynical swan song of her exit interview. What was this all for? What were her regrets? What are the things I wish I would have said? Before she was able to think of an acceptable answer to any, the radio kid roared to life and asked them who they were. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Give yourself the gift of insane savings this holiday season with Mint Mobile's best wireless deal of the year. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. That's six months of premium wireless service for the price of three. Mint Mobile lets you order and activate from home while saving tons on phone plans starting at just $15 a month. Seriously, I can't think of a better gift than turning an overpriced wireless bill into just $15 a month with Mint Mobile. How can Mint Mobile do all this for you? Well, it's all online only. No brick and mortar storefronts for upkeep, so all those savings there go into making your payment easier. Bring your own phone, and with eSIM, and boom, you'll start saving. But hey, do you need a new device? Well, Mint Mobile's got you there, too. For a limited time, you can with select devices and plans. You can get up to six months of free service. Six months! I couldn't pass up a deal like that, and you shouldn't either. So, whether you get three months or six months for free, I say it's high time to switch to Mint Mobile. Put that savings in your pocket right now for happy times ahead, or get someone on your list something extra special now. For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. I hope you enjoyed Shiver by Johnny Nava, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash johnny dash nava. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash j-o-h-n-n-y dash n-a-v-a. Handling multiple hats, Johnny handles writing, filmmaking, and more in the L.A. area. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. What you say? Would you prefer that the radio was indeed providing that sliver of hope, letting them escape their predicament? Or would you rather they go to answer that radio in some twisted monster's hand, burst through the radio like the end of Carrie? It's okay. No one has to know how sick and twisted you're hoping things go. Our second and third tales of the evening hail from Ron Reiki. He brings us some tales not from the far reaches, but from the very rim of Sweden where you never know what might be traveling to see you. In our second story of the night, things may not go too well for a couple of whippersnappers who just can't help but let trouble come to them. Without further ado, I present to you... Next, my cousin wanted to make a snowman. Next, my cousin wanted to make a snowman, but it was getting late. We just got done making snow angels, except he insisted they were snow demons. They look like angels to me. Demons. What's the difference? We looked down at our handiwork, and we thought about it. Maybe there is no difference. I think it's a snow angel during the day, and then becomes a snow demon at night. You think? I do think. We looked at the snow angels. We made about 300 of them. It was an open field behind his house. I was staying over for the night. There was nothing else to do. This was Laxfors in Sweden, a town he mispronounced Laxforskin. It was a bad joke. Worse than a bad joke. 
Maybe it was so bad it wasn't a joke. Maybe it was just a dead word sitting there in the air. There was nothing to do in Laxforsen. Back in the day, there were traders here. Now, it's pretty much just snow. Snow, snow, and more snow. There's rumors that it'll be gone soon, that with global warming, Sweden is going to become a desert. Some saying the whole world's going to be drowned in water. Others saying it'll just be sand, the two extremes. Like snow angels and snow demons, the far two ends of the earth. It's getting dark. I like it. I don't. You don't like the dark? No. Why? Because it's dark. So? You can't see anything. That's awesome. It's awesome not to see anything? Yes. Then you can use your imagination. Then all the witches and ghouls and goblins of the world can emerge. In your mind. They're not really there, but you think they're there, and that's even better. It's better to have witches and goblins in your mind. Of course. You're weird. You're even weird if you're sleeping over with me tonight. Maybe I won't. You're chicken. No, I'm not chicken, but I like chicken. It's my favorite food, actually. You carnivore. I'm glad my mom isn't vegan like yours. It'd drive me crazy. It is. The sun kept setting. We stood there, silent, watching the snow angels very slowly start to have shadows enter into their insides, very slowly start to look like perhaps they weren't made by children, but were made by something horrible. Maybe we were something horrible. I turned. I saw my cousin staring straight at me. I wondered how long he'd been doing that. I'd been so caught up in the snow angels that I forgot he was there, right there. Let's go, he said. Such a strange thing to say. Let us go. As if we'd been clinging on to this position in time, and we needed to release our grip and fall to the next position in the world that we were supposed to be. Now let go. We fell into his bedroom, and we fell into night. I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about my cousin staring at me, staring into me. He was in the same bed next to me. He only had one bed. It was big enough, but I was worried I'd wake up in the night and see him there, above me, gawking into my soul. I heard that when you sleep, cats, if your mouth is open, will crawl in, paw your soul, and emerge with it in the grip. I was always afraid of cats after I heard that. My cousin looks a bit like a cat. Something in his eyes, and the mouth, and the body, and how he breathes, and everything. I thought maybe I'd stay up the whole night. The room was dark. I figured he'd love it, the blackness. His imagination could go wild, but instead, he was tucked dangerously safe in the deep dark of sleep, where everything and anything can happen. I looked at the window, the only light coming from the moon, weak, gentle, as if the moonlight was exhausted and wanted to go to bed too. The one sole tree on the lawn outside was gnarled and hooked and unlike any tree I'd seen before. There'd been windstorms and that tree refused to be knocked over fully. It stuck at the halfway point so that it was tilted at a 45 degree angle and some of the tree had insisted on continuing to grow upwards. And some of it had started to grow toward the window, like it was reaching for the house, saying, Please help me. Uh, something flashed in front of the window. Or I think it did. I glanced down for a split second, then caught sight of it peripherally. Slowly, I crept from the blankets, not wanting to wake my cousin. I was sure he'd love it if I was afraid of something. It was better if he was asleep where he could just make love to a thousand witches and dance with ten thousand ghouls. At the window, I could feel the cold coming through. It was like I was in a whole different room, one where I could feel the gentle pain of a soft, freezing cold wind. I wonder if window was a combination of wind and owl, a protection from painful cold breeze, except the cold was coming right through the window like it barely existed. I didn't know the entomology of window. It reminded me of winter. Another strange word. 
That one I could remember. A teacher told us it means time of water or time of wetness. Another teacher told us it meant death. That was Mr. Fisk. He was retiring, so he was just saying anything he wanted to students. He told us Santa isn't real, and then he told us all about the Krampus. And then he told us that Donner means thunder, and Blitzen means lightning, and that Vixen means fierce, and the reindeer were vicious and mad. My father got really angry at this, as he used to be a reindeer herder in Sweden. So he told me never to hang out with Mr. Fisk. So I've never hung out with a 68-year-old woodshop teacher, which I wouldn't have done anyway. My cousin was friends with Mr. Fisk. He once made a wooden stake in class that he said he could use for protection from vampires. I asked if he was afraid of vampires, and he said that, no, he'd use it to kill humans to protect you, and the other vampires, saying that he wished he was a vampire too. I think he says things like that just for shock value. He's my only cousin. Now, I had one other one, but he died a few years ago. It was really quiet. It was brothers with my cousin. My cousin said his brother talks as much now dead as he did when he was alive. Such a strange thing to say. I looked into the edge of the forest surrounding the house, its shadows... I remember in English class, Mr. Fisk read to us from Macbeth. He called it Macdeath. It isn't strange to be read Shakespeare in school, except Macbeth is an odd choice, and it's an even stranger choice to have it read to you by your woodshop teacher. I remember the line. The messenger says, As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Berman, and anon methought, the wood began to move. So creepy. I know the quote, because he wouldn't let us leave class until we said it. We stood by the door, and even if you got one word wrong, you had to go to the back of the line and wait for everyone else to make their attempt in order to eventually let you leave. It took me three tries, where I must have heard a couple dozen other attempts at it, with people excited when they got it right, because then they finally got to exit the classroom. But the repetition is what made it stick. And the weirdest thing is that I started to see it. It was like the Scottish woods really became alive in my mind. I could see that scene playing out vividly. Macbeth, the witches, the woods moving. Macbeth's decapitated head. I remember my cousin asking what they did for a severed head in the play. Mr. Fisk said sometimes they wouldn't have one, where you'd just have to use your imagination. But then he said that other times he actually got to make a severed head for productions. We all had a bunch of questions about that. He told us that he did set design for theaters throughout his life. He did plays like Jerry Springer, the opera, and a bunch of Sarah Kane plays, whoever that is, and Titus Andronicus, and something called Theater of Cruelty, which is a really weird type of theater. Half of us didn't believe him. But we went and looked it up, and he wasn't joking. Adults are strange as hell. I remember driving with my dad one time, and I love children's literature. So I always wanted to go to bookstores and get Raoul Dahl, and Lewis Carroll, and J.K. Rowling, and really any good book. We were driving and went by a sign that said, Adult Bookstore, so I asked my dad if we could go in, but he said no. I told him I can't read children's literature my whole life, that sometime I have to grow up and read adult books too, and he said, not those ones. It didn't make sense. I kept insisting, and we got into a really big argument. He said the books in there aren't even books, that they were just pictures. I'm like, cartoons? No, not cartoons, he said. He said it's just naked women. I didn't believe him. He said it is. I told him to stop lying. He screamed at me, It is! It was the strangest moment of my life. And then my cousin introduced me to that world. He had a desk in his room where Mr. Fisk helped him to make a secret passage, and inside he had hidden pornography and satanic books and something in a bag that either looked like drugs or else something else that actual witches would use. In the darkness, I glanced over at the desk, and that's when I saw my cousin standing behind me. 
I realized he'd been slowly, very slowly, very, very slowly, making a game of it trying to sneak up on me. Luckily, the idea of his desk had come into my mind. Otherwise, I have no idea what he'd have done if he'd successfully come up all the way behind me. What are you looking at? You? What were you looking at before? Outside. What? Eh, nothing, I said. I saw something out there. You're just trying to scare me. I saw something out there. I'm serious. What? I don't know. Don't try to scare me. I'm not. I thought if I should tell him and decided I should. I saw it, too. I knew it. We went to the window. The cold was even colder now. The wind windier. And there, beyond the tree, beyond the house's front lawn, we could see the thick nearby forest. Much of the forest was blocked by that one tree, but we could see around it, through the branches, and behind the tree, the forest was moving. Towards us. We went up to the glass. It was walking, shadows, or floating, flying. Hovering just above the snow, like perhaps they were walking on it, but so gently as if one sole cell of their body was touching one sole flake of snow. And that was enough. And there were dozens of them, then an army of them. And the whole entire yard was filled with these shapes that looked familiar, but we were unsure. It was like night had become alive, as if darkness itself had begun to live. It was three hundred snow angels come to life. Darkened by night, and soulless, no expression, just staring straight into us without eyes and approaching slowly, like my cousin had been doing with me. The bedroom light turned on. We spun around. My cousin's mother was there, in the doorway. Why are you two up so late? But before we could answer, another form appeared behind her. Multiple forms. Demons. And they seemed to tear his mother apart and ingest her but with no blood as if her body could easily come apart, as if we didn't know all along that the human body is made up of sections of food, the way that cows are chuck and shank and rib and rump and round and flank. And then a hundred demons came through the walls. We were their mothers. We made them. The desk floated into the air. We did, too. They floated us outside through the window, which they could go through easily. But we couldn't. My cousin going first. So his flesh shattered the glass. His body cut all over so that his blood trickled down onto the snow. I followed, the grace of having no glass, just battering an elbow against the window pane and my feet. And we were outside in the freezing cold. They didn't speak, but they spoke. They were children, our children. We'd made them, birthed them. Now they wanted to play. They wanted to make a snowman. We said we would. We didn't speak. They could read our minds. We could read our minds. I could sense the fear in my cousin like a lamp. Like a lamp being sprayed with oil, gas, his fear rising hot. He bled onto the snow. A snowman, said the angels, without speaking. Yes, a snowman. We crouched, started to grab snowballs, but it was too cold. Snow wouldn't stick. The angels wanted a snowman now. They looked at my cousin. He opened his mouth to speak, and they stuffed snow inside. His mouth opened even wider to cough, so they stuffed more snow inside. He opened his mouth to tell them to stop, and they stuffed more snow inside. He gagged, so they stuffed more snow inside. His mouth became filled with snow, so much so that it held his mouth open, which made it easier for them to stuff even more snow inside. They pressed down hard so that it went into his throat, down his throat, into his stomach, and into his lungs. And they kept pressing snow inside. Snow shoved into his mouth and nostrils and ears and eyes and mouth. Always his mouth. Until it felt as if he were growing plump, becoming a bit circular in his torso and head and legs. And he turned cyanotic blue and then white snow white, his body covered with snow on the inside. And they stopped, and they admired what they'd made. And they turned and looked at me. And I looked off to the side because something drew my attention there. 
and off to the side I saw multiple snow angels, if that's what they were, and they weren't. But I could see them lying down, flapping their wings, making other demons, and those demons would rise, and lie back down and flap their wings and make another demon, and it kept on going like that, fractals, mirrors, echoes, hellish echoes, but they weren't good at it, would struggle, make errors, the wings flapping too aggressively, so that some of the newly created angels were disfigured, lopsided, so they grabbed me held me down, and forced me to make a snow angel. Then yanked me up, threw me down, pulled me, yanked at my legs and arms to make another, and then picked me up again and tossed me, and made me make another one. A neighbor's bedroom light flashed on in the distance, the form of a couple in a window, and them watching me, uncertain, this thing that I was now, being picked up, tossed to the ground, my arms, legs, hyperextended, so that I couldn't walk, But I didn't need to, as they were doing all the work. My body a toy, my body a thing. And each time that I'd rise, an angel would rise below me. And they'd grab onto me, joining the others. And there I went, across this field, being forced to do this over and over, from one field to the next, on to the next one, and the next, 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 and the next. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Thanksgiving may be behind us, but that doesn't mean that's the only cold turkey you might be subjecting yourself to. You see, some people think that cold turkey is also a way to stop bad habits, but that can be tough because why well, all the good habits can go out the window with the bad. Well, worry no more, because the Fume is here to make stopping your bad habit fun. How can it be fun, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Because Fume keeps all the little things intact while allowing you to drop only the bad part of your habit. It's an air device. No vapors. No electronics. Just add a flavored air canister, take a breath, and enjoy the refreshing light taste of things like maple pepper, or my favorite, sparkling grapefruit, instead of something sticky and heavy, or worse. And feel free to fiddle with the handsome design and shape of the fume device itself. Perfect for keeping your mind and fingers busy so you can relax. And focus on stopping in a fun and exciting way. Stopping something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. I hope you enjoyed Next, My Cousin Wanted to Make a Snowman by Ron Reiki as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured authors can be found by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash ron dash reiki. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash r-o-n dash r-i-e-k-k-i be it michigan or sweden ron keeps an eye on the wintry northlands to bring you the stories of things that go bump in the snow thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author not to worry he stopped bouncing folks what's left of him has anyway But sometimes what comes to visit you in the cold takes on a more sinister form, something much more well-known to the residents. But even if you know how to keep yourself safe, the unexpected can still happen. Whether that's a good thing remains to be seen. Without further ado, I present to you North. North. 
When Arnie, the neighbor's boy, went missing, my daughter Brooklyn casually mentioned Vuoro, and I told her never to casually mention Vuoro. In fact, I told her to never mention Vuoro at all. Her reply was to ask me if Vuoro only eats boys. I told her that no, Vuoro eats anything alive. Would she eat a steak? No, but she'd eat a cow. Would she eat a dead child? I told her not to say things like that, and then I told her that no, Vuoro does not eat dead children, only living children. Then I'd kill myself before she ate me. Outside the window, a tree in the front yard looked in on us. My daughter saw what I was looking at. That tree wasn't there before, she said. Yes, it was, I think, I said. No, she said. And I heard the front door slam. I watched my daughter walk up to the tree. I let her. It was just a tree. Or maybe not. Vuoro isn't a witch. Vuoro would eat witches. Vuoro is one of the great Samai ghosts. I'm a Samai. My daughter is a Samai. We're Laplanders, but we never use the word Lapland. That horrible word translates as the land of idiots. It's a colonizer's word. A word of humiliation, the way that language tries to suck on your blood and lets you reclaim the word. Samai is the Samai word for Samai. It's our word. And we have our ghosts. We have our stories. But for us, our stories are real. This is Kajani, and in Kajani territory. I have a secret for you. People go north thinking the Aurora Borealis is better up there. But it actually weakens the further north you go. The reason my people have lived here since before Columbus is because with the northern lights, this is the most beautiful place in the world. My ex-wife is Anishinaabe. She told me the Anishinaabe call those lights the Northern Ghosts. Our most beautiful moment, actually, the world's most beautiful moment, is when the sky is filled with ghosts, or what looks like ghosts. And this was last night. And one of those ghosts came down and took Arnie. It wouldn't take my daughter or my son. They would put up too much of a fight, I know. I experienced that wonderful fight daily. My son, Rob, is addicted to the couch. He'd sleep through Armageddon. In fact, all of the rumbling would just lullaby him to sleep. He'd count locusts like sheep and drift off into one of his beautiful nightmares. He's the only boy I know who has a nightmare and wakes me up in the middle of the night to tell me it wasn't scary enough. In the dark, the moonlight, failing to do any good, at seeing his face clearly, he'd say... The snakes of my dreams are too lethargic. Did you just wear, use the word lethargic? Isn't that right? I mean, lazy, like the snakes didn't even bother to come after me or anything. I told him to go to sleep. He did. I look at him on the couch. Fuaro, if she comes tonight, will mistake him for dead, I assume. He'd be safe. It's my little girl I worry about, and at that thought, I heard her outside screaming at a tree. From the window, I watched her having a deep conversation with the branches. I assumed she was warning it. Well, maybe not. Who knows with her? She stormed back into the house, announcing that Buraro's coming tonight. Don't say that. Get ready. Her bedroom door would have slammed, but she didn't have a bedroom door. I'd taken it off. She'd broken the thing so many times that I figured it was better for her to slam air. I told her she still had a door, but now it was invisible. I told her I thought she'd prefer an invisible door to a visible door. She thought about it and agreed. Later that night, while eating supper, Brooklyn cleared her throat and said, Mr. Thomas told me that when people burn to death, they smell like pork. Who's Mr. Thomas? The paramedic. What paramedic? The one who came to the neighbors last night. A paramedic came to the neighbors last night? Don't you have eyes? You were two seconds from being sent to your room. I took a bite of roast and told Rob to wake up while he was eating. I am awake. Then open your eyes. 
When you're awake, we keep our eyes open. It, it's a thing humans do. Rob opened his eyes and tried to keep them open without blinking. I could tell it hurt him. I put my fork down and waited to see how long he could go. He went long. I imagined him becoming a Navy SEAL one day. Except Navy SEALs have to wake up at 3 a.m. I imagined him being a seal one day, a mammal suntanning its stomach on a lagoon rock having its twelfth straight hour of daydreaming. What are you thinking about? asked Brooklyn. I went to pour myself some milk, but my glass was already full. Are we going to be eating tonight? she asked. No, I said and poured more gravy instead. We have to all keep water in our bedrooms tonight. We know. I told them already. Furaro can't enter a room if it contains water. Before, my daughter had asked me how much water exactly. I didn't know. I just know that all smart semi keep water in their bedrooms. Otherwise, Furaro can enter. And all doors are invisible to Furaro. All walls, too. She can walk through anything. Except bodies. Those she can eat. But she can't stay long enough to eat anyone if there's water. I'd seen the ambulance next door. I knew there was a paramedic. I wondered what the neighbor's bedroom looked like. To eat an entire child, I imagined, would not be clean and clear and easy. I imagined the red. I imagined every shade of red. Tuscan and electric crimson and rose and rust and oxblood and red violet all over that boy's bedroom. In Samai's stories, there's a lot of cannibalism, because of our stalo, our cannibalistic giants of the wild, and because of our starved ghosts. They all seem so hungry, so eager for the flesh of those who still feel cold. I imagine the millions of ghosts of the world all brutally craving cold. In the Samai language, there are more than 100 ways to say snow. We actually have a word for the ghosts of the snow. Those ghosts who are seen in blizzards, in storms, their body almost snow-blind. You can't say the word. You're not supposed to say the word. Ferraro, my daughter says, and twirls her spoon in her potatoes. That night I ensure and re-ensure that my daughter and son have more than one cup of water in their rooms. I only had one thermos, so I saved it for my daughter, who would be much more likely to knock a cup over. I didn't want the water to be absorbed or evaporated or in any way not be there. I wanted water to claim the room. I even hid a couple of glasses in the back of each of their closets. Brooklyn asked if it would be smarter if we all just drank a bunch of water before going to sleep. But I didn't want her getting up in the middle of the night and wandering the house. I told her to stay in her room for the night. She said she wanted to stay in my room. I tried to assure her that Fuaro is a myth, folklore. Brooklyn looked down at the floor, the cups of water at her feet by her bed. I thought all we need is one, she said. I'm being safe. I went to bed. I couldn't sleep. I listened to the house, its thirst. I drifted off. Night happens and gets into your skin. The dark lulls. The yell woke me up. I believe it was the word dad, or maybe dead. I sat up, heard it again. It was dad. I turned on the light and picked up a cup of water, holding it before me like a lantern. I turned on the hallway light. In a row in front of Brooklyn's bedroom stood all of the cups, the thermos on its side empty. Next to the thermos stood Rob. She should show you what she's done. Who should? Puraro. Well, you mean Brooklyn? Both, said Rob. Brooklyn stepped out of the shadows of her room. Where's her water? She took it out. Why? She did something bad. What? Brooklyn came to the edge of her bedroom, standing before her door a step outside of the hallway. Explain yourself, I yelled at my daughter. She can't, said Rob. She can't? She can't speak. I imagined Ferraro eating her throat. I looked to see if her neck was only blood, but she looked the same. Maybe her cheeks were a little swollen. Put the water back in your room, I said. 
Brooklyn shook her head no. I stepped forward with the cup, about to go into her room, but Rob grabbed me. He looked at his sister. She ate Ferraro. She what? Ferraro is in her stomach, he said. Quit playing games, let me sleep. I picked up the thermos. I saw a spider inside and dropped the bottle. It cluttered on the floor and rolled to Brooklyn's feet. The spider crawled out. Rob stared at his sister, ignoring the spider. Show him, Rob said. Enough, I said. She should not have eaten Veraro. No, I said. I told you so, Rob said. Say something, I said to my silent daughter. Brooklyn opened her mouth and kept opening it and kept opening as a fingernail emerged and another and a hand and another hand and a half-human, half-reindeer head seemed to gasp for air and another skeleton, that is, Raro's body, its feet hooves stamping on my daughter's tongue and then leaping into the room, hovering there mid-air then swinging around and exploding through a wall so that my daughter stood alone on an empty stomach. She walked by me to the front room, turning on all the lights, and then, before going outside, she turned on the front porch light. On the steps, she took my hands and put them on her shoulders. The tree, she said. Gone. It was. The absence was calming. You could see the sky, the third quarter moon, and clearly visible the North Star. We believe that the North Star is the top point of the pole that holds up the world. If the North Star should slip, the entirety of our world would plummet into oblivion. My daughter stood still, staring up at it, her posture iron and steel. I hope you enjoyed North by Ron Reiki as performed by yours truly. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other podcast episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep. If you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Chiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. 
If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jivey channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha 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 ha!